Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the very first issue briefing of day two of the World Economic Forum 2015 annual meeting. I can't think of a more interesting and timely briefing on the, than the subject we're about to uh, raise here, which is income inequality. It's been a, a, a major theme at the start of the week. We had a, a, a key report um, by Oxfam noting that Winnie Bianima, the executive director of Oxfam, is actually a co-chair of this meeting on the very subject of inclusive growth and inequality. The World Economic Forum um, itself published a, a discussion paper at the start of the week on Sunday uh, looking at the, the possible interventions and policy levers available to leaders and, and, and governments in, uh, in creating mutuality between growth and social inclusion. Uh, following in uh, through the week, of course, President Obama's State of Union was very much based on middle class economics and how to, how to uh, uh, improve uh, social equity and, and, and lower inequality. This week, of course, uh, as we're moving on to today, we have a very big announcement by the uh, European Central Bank, uh, which may take the economic discussion in a different direction. But in the meantime, I'm very delighted to be joined by Christopher Pissarides, uh, the Regis Professor of Economics, London School of Economics and Political Science in the UK. He's also a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on New Growth Models and a, a Nobel Laureate. Christopher, I'd just like to uh, invite you, uh, for the benefit of our audience and our <coughs> audience watching us live on our web platform, to just uh, offer some remarks on uh, how you see the state of the income inequality debate at this very moment in time. Yes, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Um, I will start my remarks by, with some general comments about the um, free market system that we're pushing uh, nowadays through structural reforms, uh, what we're seeing uh, happening in uh, North America, uh, Europe, and uh, by extension throughout the world. And, and the key issue, I think, about inequality is that um, free markets are good for um, giving the incentives and, and, and working through the private sector for giving the incentives for productivity, for new innovation, new technology, productivity uh, rises. In other words, for wealth creation in the market. And we're seeing that uh, happening, especially in the United States as the leading free market economy, but also in, in Europe. However, they are not very good, the free markets, in the distribution of the rewards from uh, wealth creation. They tend to favor the um, successes much more than the ones that go along and whose input is absolutely necessary in the wealth creation. Of course, it's only right that those who succeed in inventing something good in new technology, uh, a new form of organization of the company, those who read the market better, it's only fair that they should get uh, paid more. But the way that um, voters nowadays in uh, our democracies are responding is by saying that also those who go along and contribute to a whole host of services or production of manufacturing goods that are, uh, that, that are necessary for any economy to function should also be rewarded uh, generously. And it is my belief is what we are seeing in the market today is that if we leave that alone to take care of that, uh, to some extent the way that uh, it's been done in the United States and not, not quite along the lines that um, President Obama was uh, saying in his uh, uh, State of the Union address, but uh, more the way the market has been working there, is that the outcomes are that um, there is extreme inequality that uh, is a matter of concern. And the question is, what do we do about that inequality? It's not an easy question, but then there are many ideas being floated around here and uh, in the literature, and that's something that we might be debating during this uh, press briefing. Uh, and of course, the debate to date is focused so much on redistribution through tax. Um, and yet, there must be other, one would hope, other options. Uh, and and to, to the risk um, mentioning again the report, the discussion paper that, that the forum published uh, earlier this week, which is very much the start of a debate, the start of our work and, and our, uh, our uh, expansion into looking into this sector, looking at possibly other ideas as to whether you can actually achieve economic growth and drive in and achieve a social dividend at the same time. Is this mm -hmm. possible? Is, is this a holy grail? Or uh, is it something we could achieve, indeed, um, aim for? Well, first, as, as, as a matter of principle, I believe that the way to achieve more equality is not through punishing high incomes, but through uh, boosting low incomes. It's through m more employment, more job creation. Um, 
better jobs at the lower end of the market through maybe a b better education. But if you think it m more specifically and, and if you try to address the issue w with examples, you know, what do we do about such and such, it, it's inevitable that some form of redistribution will have to take place. Otherwise, uh, where do the resources come from to uh, create the jobs at the lower end and to provide the education and training that is necessary for, for, for people to have uh, uh, more respectable incomes and reduce inequality? Um, the um, redistribution will have to take place with full cooperation of private and public sectors. It's not something that uh, it has to be imposed only from one side and, and the other side trying to evade it. And in, in order to achieve that, it's got to be a, a kind of more cooperative uh, solution to the problem of inequality. Everyone has to agree about what uh, needs to be done. And there are many, many different options. To give you one option that I don't think is good, and. Um, I don't think it, it can work in today's uh, open, globalized wor uh, world, uh, is when you tax high incomes and you simply take the money and you pass it on as transfers to lower incomes. I don't think that's a, a good solution. It's being tried, of course, and it's still taking place in some countries. But it's not because it takes away the incentive from um, the, the lower skilled people to acquire skills and go into the labor market because they get the money anyway by doing nothing. And it creates disincentives to high incomes to stay in the country and, and continue uh, working hard, looking for new uh, ventures uh, to achieve the high incomes. There are, however, uh, more imaginative, more um, uh, creative, if you like, ways of uh, redistributing in incomes. And that's what we should be looking at. Who's doing, it? Who's doing that well right now? Are there any, any shining examples of creative policy that is, uh, that is achieving um, you know, at least measured success in uh, reducing inequality? Well, the, the most successful countries in, in that have been the Scandinavian countries. And if we take Sweden as an example, it reflects very much what other countries like Denmark and Norway are doing in that region of the world, um, is re redistribution through the market, if you like. In fact, what's happening is that uh, high incomes are taxed, by average taxes in, in, in that country are high, but, but because there is trust in the public sector that is going to make good use of that money, uh, people pay it, uh, tax evasion is very low. So number one thing that is essential to make that uh, system succeed is that you do have to have trust in the public sector. You should be free of corruption and should be trusted by the private sector that it would provide a good service. And the way that the revenue is used is to boost job creation. So instead of transferring the revenue directly to families with low income, what you do is that you use it to create jobs in the market that would provide services that otherwise wouldn't be created um, by the free market at a reasonable uh, price that um, people will want to take up. The best example of such a, a service is, um, is childcare. If you what, what's happening in, in Sweden is that childcare services are subsidized, and therefore, when um, a couple have a child, they can buy childcare services through the market at fairly low rates. What that encourages them to, to do is to buy the childcare services and then both parents going out to work. So there is incentive to create a job for both the mother and the father. And at the same time, you're creating a job in, in childcare services, uh, which is uh, subsidized by the revenue that is raised through the taxes on the higher incomes. This is boosting the family income at the lower end of the income distribution, the parents that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford the childcare, is boosting the income of a childcare worker because his or her salary is subsidized. And it, it reduces inequality because it raises the lower incomes rather than uh, not allowing high incomes to, to take place and prosper. Of course, 
the, the downside, some people might say, is that there is tax. You know, Sweden, Sweden is a high tax country. But it's a very good use of the tax revenue addressed at the issue of inequality. So ultimately, it's a decision of the voter. Because what is happening in other countries in, in this dimension, and it Italy is a good example of the other country where uh, this kind of channel doesn't work, is that uh, when the government doesn't take much interest in services like childcare, what the mother will say, especially a mother that doesn't have access to high income jobs, what she might say is, is why should I go out, get a job, earn an income that is uh, that can hardly pay for a childcare uh, service in the market, and then I have to pass my child on to someone else to look after, and financially I'm not better off in any way. I might as well stay at home and look after my own child, and, and that's one of the reasons, if not the main reason, that we're seeing extremely low rates of female participation in Italy. Indeed, and, and of course, gender and, and other countries, yeah. gender, gender parity, and, 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 and gender inequality is a result. Much uh, higher. Uh, exactly, another another global challenge hmm. of the forum. <coughs> pardon, pardon the uh, shameless promotion of our own work here. Um, let's say, let's stay on geography for the time being. We had the chief mm -hmm. economist of one of Brazil's largest banks here yesterday, and one of his comments was that Latin America was actually relatively successful in addressing inequality in relative terms to to other regions in the world. And yet the growth outlook for that region is, uh, is, is not so promising. Is inequality something that policymakers can only really afford to address in the good times? It, that, 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 again, is, is very much a political decision. But it is much easier to address inequality in the good times because um, b people get used to levels of income very easily. If, if incomes are rising and you take in part of that uh, rise in income to use to reduce inequality, then it's much more acceptable than if incomes have been at a certain level for a long time of time, uh, for, for, for a long stretch of time, and suddenly government comes along and says, ah, now there is inequality that I'm concerned about. I'm going to take some of that income that you got used to, so you have to adjust your standard of living as a consequence uh, so as to pass it on to lower incomes. That would be much less acceptable. So politically, it's much easier to do it when incomes are rising. Uh, Latin America, of course, that you mentioned, I, I have to say I don't know as much about them as I do about Europe, given my location. But from what I know, Brazil does have one of the highest inequality uh, indices in the world. So it, they, they do need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Question, sir. Could you please, for the benefit of our audience, and Mr. Pissaridis, give us your name and your outlook? Outlet, sorry. Hi. It's and Jim your outlook, possibly. It's Jim Edwards from Business Insider UK. Um, I was hoping you could talk about the Oxfam report. Is it true, is that a statistic true, that the 1% now own more, I can't remember, is it more than 50% of everybody else, or is it more than I think it's slightly else? under 50%, slightly but under it's climbing yeah. towards that figure. Right. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Is that true? I, I, I have no, no reason at all to believe that it's not true. It's... Um, it, it's a shocking statistic, of course, and, and, and given the inequality that we're seeing in the world today, it, it's not difficult to construct other shocking uh, statistics, even, you know, even within countries, how much wealth is owned by the top 1% and how much with the bottom. It, it, it's not, you know, I mean, I mean, it's obviously something to, to worry about, but, but I think there is more um, sensationalist uh, um, attached to such uh, s statistics than um, substance of what you do, really. Um, you see, my, you see my, my view is that the, the, the real issue and what you should really be addre addressing at is poverty. And th there are ways, and thinking about ways to address uh, poverty and to raise low incomes is far more important for uh, human welfare in the way uh, our democracies will uh, will respond to these uh, policies than um, punishing the very high incomes. Whereas if you present it in a way of oh, the top 1% or the 80 wealthiest people in the world have as much wealth as uh, two or three billion people or something, then someone's immediate uh, inclination is to say, uh, who are they? Let's tax them. You know, take some of their wealth away and redistribute them. But that would be completely wrong uh, approach to the problem. 
so although so so although such uh, statistics are, are true and and it's another way of uh, of saying there is extreme inequality in, in the world i i think we'd be doing better to uh, emphasize ways of of reducing poverty rather than sensationalizing the issue by saying how much the very rich people are worth. Okay, so just to extend my question a little bit further, um, Piketty has made this great case that uh, the structure of capitalism by definition creates more inequality as it goes along and the inequality becomes more extreme as it goes along. And he basically strongly suggests that this might lead to a level of political instability when the system just loses legitimacy because the mm. vast majority of people see that they cannot possibly become as successful as the 1% or w w whatever percentage it is right at the top. Mm. Do you agree with that? Yes, with the, with the Piketty thesis, with the analysis at least, I agree and many, many if not most, well I would think most if not all economists would agree with him. You know, of course, before he published this, this book, he had um, a long series of uh, articles in the um, professional uh, journals where he w was making uh, similar cases, and, and I agree entirely. In fact, he was a student at the London School of Economics, and I, I taught him as a student <laughs> along with others, and, and and he was a very very bright person. You must be. With him. <laughs> I, I I agree entirely, and I also agree entirely that he's bringing. Um, uh, that is bringing political instability. Uh, but again, what I would emphasize is that the political instability and the objections are, are, are coming from the people at the lower end of the distribution. It's, it's not jealousy because some people are very wealthy that are causing the problems. It's more the problem of, of how do you live, how can you get a, a comfortable standard of living in a country of plenty? And um, we're, we're seeing that all the time. You see, I mean, let me use an example which is very much in the news now, which is the, the Greek election and what's happening in, in Greece, which is taking place on Sunday. The reason, the, the protest vote we are seeing, and the reason so many Greeks are abandoning uh, conventional parties with their centrist policies and moving to extreme left, is not that there are wealthy Greeks and there are many wealthy Greeks, especially ship owners, bankers. Most of them are based in London, Geneva, and so on. But 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 they are Greek. They are, they are well known in, in Greece. But that that's not the reason, though. There is that protest vote there. The reason that is taking place is that um, is that the country has suffered a 25 percent fall in GDP and wages, especially low wages. Is suffered a fall in pensions, and it's got. 25% overall unemployment and 50% youth unemployment, and that's been going on for four years now. Uh, and and it's those people who are protesting and and voting for extreme uh, political parties. It's not that all of a sudden they realize that there are uh, Greeks with billions uh, s sitting in um, mansions in in Switzerland and uh, and Britain and owning whole Greek islands that they, they say, no, I have to vote for a party that is going to go after them. Not at all. It, it, it's more that uh, vote for a party that is going to go after uh, the Eurozone uh, uh, institutions and troikas that have imposed those policies on Greece and uh, have been followed by previous political parties. Okay, my last question, and I'll, mm. I'll stop monopolizing the questions. Um, I was really interested in your childcare idea um, can you quantify that? How many billion would it add to a country's GDP if it rolled out a really big subsidized childcare program? Can you put it in percentage terms or dollar terms? I, I could, but not right now. And, and in fact, I'm <laughs> glad. That We've I, had three minutes of this session I, left, I'm, so I'm, we're, we're being ambitious. I'm glad, <laughs> I, I'm glad you asked it because I, I am supervising a very big project financed by the European Research Council on, on precisely this issue of, uh, of, of job creation and how much it will add to G, uh, GNP and employment uh, from this kind of service. I mean, we, we started the work already. Um, I, 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 so far, we looked at the um, employment numbers and how many jobs they're creating, and they're creating. Um, I would think, you know, when I use the comparison with Italy, they are creating something twice, as, at least twice as many jobs in these services in in Sweden as in Italy. Something like 12 to 13 percent of employment is in, in in this kind of service. Not only childcare, but also other health services. You know, health workers and and uh, homes for older people to look after. 
so, so it would be substantial. It, it, some, something like 12 to 15 percent of employment is in the provision of services that have to do with uh, health care, uh, with care in general, both health care and child care. Um, but but to, to generalize from your question, though, and I'm really glad you asked it, asked it is that it's got, the, if, if the money is to be paid in the form of tax without uh, trying to find ways of, of, of evading the tax, it, it's got to be productive. In other words, you have to pay your taxes and you have to see the result in, uh, in job creation and wealth creation in some sector of the economy. And that's, and that's what we're seeing there. We're seeing it in job creation, which contrasts sharply with, the other, with other countries. Uh, I don't know if I should name them, where, where taxes are almost as high, but you don't see the result in anything other than an extremely high uh, pay for politicians and civil servants and... And <laughs> well, I named one, I, I, I named one already. Oh, maybe I should. Maybe I could name it because the current prime minister is doing a fantastic job in trying to reform it. But it, but it, Italy is a good example. Italy has almost as high taxes as, as Sweden, but um, but the money goes to the, you know they have the highest paid politicians, highest paid uh, senior civil servants, a big civil service, and uh, no m market driven. Uh, provision of uh, of services which will create jobs, and the, the only reason I'm mentioning it is that uh, it, is that I do think the um, Renzi program of reform is moving in the right direction, and and um, and and I hope it succeeds because it will be good for the country and it will be good for the eurozone. Thank you. We have very precious little time, but I want to get one of the questions we received over social media mm -hmm. um, uh, to put to you, Mr. Pesaridis. Uh, obviously, today, European Central Banks are going to make a decision widely expected to be quantitative easing. Uh, so the question is, um, what would be your advice? Are there other tools in the toolkit that could be used? What's your, what's your advice to, the, to Mr. Draghi? My, 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 advi my advice to Mr. Draghi is to, is to do what he's been hinting that, uh, that he was going to do. It's long overdue, but it's never too late. Uh, 50, 50 billion a year for the next five, sorry, 50 billion a, a month for the next uh, 12 months is, is, is not a good, uh, it, sorry, is not bad to begin with. In fact, it's, it would be a very good QE. You know, it's got to be uh, generous. But, but let's not now sit back and say good QE has been done so we can forget about everything else. There, there are three things that have to be done uh, simultaneously. One is the QE to... Uh, relieve the pressures on, on the deflationary pressures. Mm -hmm. Two is the structural reforms because they will increase our productivity and they have to carry on. You know, what Merkel was saying yesterday that she was against QE because they would undermine structural reforms is that I, I, I hope she's wrong because structural reforms are necessary. I agree entirely with that line. What I don't agree with is that you need all this austerity and, and, and no QE because of the structural reforms. I think they have to be carried on simultaneously and if anything, the QE has to come before the structural reforms mm -hmm. uh, because deflation is not good for that. And number three, uh, you need to deal with fiscal policy. And, and, and I think the countries that have room within the Maastricht criteria within the Eurozone to, uh, um, have to pursue a more expansionary fiscal policy have to do it. Now, of course, the main country that has that is Germany. And they've already said that far from following ex expansionary policy, they are going to um, reduce spending even more because they want to balance the budget next year, this year, 2015, uh, w for which there is absolutely no need. It, 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 Germany has been benefiting from a weak euro because of the problems of the eurozone for many, many years. If it um, remains within the Maastricht criteria but spends something like 1% of its GDP more, hopefully even more, 1.5% uh, uh, to help boost economic activity in the Eurozone through investment, you know, not uh, you know, sort of carefully uh, planned spending. It will help both QE to have a bigger impact on our economies, and it will help the structural reform process because there will be more um, uh, investment to see positive results from, from the structural reform. So far from... Um, from Mrs. Merkel saying that uh, uh, she's worried that any that, that QE might undermine structural reform, what I'd say is that yes to QE, yes to more fiscal expansion within Maastricht, and those will help structural reform rather than underline it. Uh, sorry, undermine it. 
I could go on all morning. It's been fascinating. Thank you very much, Mr. Pissaridis. Thank you all for joining us here in the room and online. We'll look forward to welcoming you back for our next press conference, which is uh, later on this morning. Thanks very much indeed.